I think most people today are generally well aware of the uh, reported efficacy of caloric restriction in life extension. Uh, there are no shortage of people that are now looking at ways to mimic caloric restriction, be it pharmacologically with molecules or be it using dietary interventions that sort of act like transient periods of caloric restriction, all in search of what we believe CR does. But let, let's maybe have you explain to people what this history looks like. Sure. Well, well the first person to really do this in a, in, in a formal way was, as you mentioned, uh, Clive McKay, who was a nutritionist at, at Cornell at the time. And he wasn't interested in aging either. He was interested in growth and uh, how to make animals grow faster because that has all kinds of agricultural implications. Um, and so in studying growth, he was looking at the effect of restricting the diet on growth rate. And when he did that, he noticed that his animals seemed to be staying healthy longer and living longer when he fed them less. And he did this in fish, he did some stuff in, in dogs, although he didn't look all the way through their lifespan. And then he finally did this, ex this, this um, experiment in rats. And that, in that one, he let them live their entire lives and documented very convincingly how dietary restriction made, in this case, only females, not males, um, live longer. And um, the, the interesting thing about McKay is that about a decade ago, I was, I, I was a, a visiting scholar uh, at, in Ithaca, New York for a week. And I went to the Cornell libraries and I looked through all of his old papers. And I don't think he ever really appreciated the significance of, of what he'd done because he didn't really this follow up This was in the 1930s, that. if I recall. Yeah, this was in the 1930s, and yeah. he was active until the 1960s. But he got uh, into producing, you know, high-protein bread and um, um, making nutritional food for the military during World War II, mm -hmm. and he really kind of dropped this whole thing. So even though he made what, in retrospect, was really... I think a landmark discovery. I don't think he really appreciated that because he was never focused really on longevity. So what are the ways in which this got um, validated and repeated throughout time? Who was the next person to pick up that baton? You know, I'm, I'm, I'm not exactly sure who the next person was. There were a whole bunch of peoples starting really after World War II that started looking at it more closely in rats and more closely in mice. And there were actually um, a whole bunch of people working on invertebrates that did this experiment by accident. And I'm one of them, actually. The first paper I published um, on this topic was some stuff that I did during my PhD. So my PhD um, was testing all these mathematical models about combat, but I was testing it in a small spider. And as part of that experiment, I had groups of spiders that I, were, I was feeding various amounts. And I would keep them until they died, but I wasn't paying any attention to that. Once I, once I discovered all of this work, I went back to my data and I said, well, I wonder what happened when I fed them less. And it turned out the less I fed them, the longer they lived. And so after World War II, people really started getting interested in this. And there were a number of people, there was mouse studies now, um, rat studies. There was really, uh, I think the next big advance was when Roy Walford uh, got into it, who was very interested, not just in how mice age, but how that might tell him something about human aging. And Ed Masaro, another researcher who followed up on rats. And those two, I think, really took it to the next, jumped it to the next level, which is, can we understand why this is happening? Um, there was really very little investigation of that previously, uh, but Walford, who was an immunologist, um, was very convinced that was doing something to the immune system, and that was at the base of it. And Masaro was, didn't really have his own hypotheses, but he thought that it was a great way to test hypotheses about how aging worked. The other big difference between these really fascinating characters, I mean, Walford, 
one, probably one of the most interesting and colorful personalities. You must have known him because he only died, tw what, maybe 20 years ago, 25 years ago? Oh, yeah. In fact, my first paper, uh, he published the figure out of my spider paper before it was published in a real journal um, because he had heard about my work and he asked that I'm, I'm writing a book. Can I put this figure in my book? So, oh, yeah, I knew Roy uh, quite well. Of course, he's famous for the biodome, right? That's That was the... Yeah, yeah, uh, um, the biosphere oh, too. Oh, biosphere, right? yeah, 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 sorry. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it's pretty interesting. When I was writing my book on, you know, so the biosphere too was this inadvertent experiment on dietary restriction because these people were sealed in this dome and they couldn't grow as much food as they thought. And Roy was the was the doctor in there. And so this, this was a great opportunity. You know, he wanted to know how dietary restriction worked in people. And here he had uh, all of these people that couldn't make enough. Anyway. Um, how long were they in the biosphere? Two years. Two, two years. And when you look at pictures of him when he came out, I mean, he looked pretty emaciated. Oh, he looked horrible. He looked absolutely horrible. In fact, um, they have this famous picture of them all standing on the rafters in the biosphere when they went in naked and they had the same picture that Roy showed at a meeting when they came out and you've seen pictures of him he looks like he just emerged from a concentration camp right yeah well I wanted to use the, and they all look like that uh, I wanted to use that picture before and after in my book on aging and so I asked Roy about that and he said, I'd, I'd love to give you that picture, but um, everything's tied up in litigation. It turned out that the people in that experiment had become uh, enemies and everybody was suing everybody else over everything having to do with the biosphere. So psychologically, that wasn't such a great success. Um, people would disagree about whether it was a success scientifically or not. Roy thought it had you know, he looked at it in one way, thought it proved everything that he had seen in mice was true in people. Other people were looking at it and say, oh my gosh, I don't know how you felt, but you just looked terrible. And then he died. Yeah, he died young, right? I not, mean, yeah, well, he wasn't that young. I think he was 79 or something. Oh, okay. but, I thought he was younger. But he was, always, he was always one of these people that if you knew his age, you'd say, man, that guy looks 20 years younger right. than he is. But after he came out of the biosphere, he didn't look like that anymore. Now, the other thing, to be fair, that happened in the biosphere is that the atmosphere got really out of whack. Um, and they ended up, without realizing it, they had so little oxygen, they were living at the equivalent of about 17,000 feet. Oh. And so, yeah, and they'd been doing that for, they didn't know how long. Uh, eventually, so they had to refresh the air in the environment. And he attributed his later health problems to that. Not which is certainly plausible. I mean, we'll never know. Yeah. But yeah, to spend <laughs> some portion of two years at Everest Base Camp, if you haven't grown up there, it's one thing if you're a Sherpa, right? But it's another thing right. if you've spent your whole life at sea level. Uh -huh.